there are more to come. Rory Challens is in Kyiv. Rory, air raid warnings sounded across Ukraine again this morning. Tell us about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, active air raid warning has been on for at least three hours now. That's why I'm wearing uh, this body armor across the whole of Ukraine. We understand that Russian strategic bombers, Tupolev bombers, have been up over the Caspian Sea region uh, and launching more cruise missiles at targets uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the latest that we know of is that there were at least two that were intercepted over the Kiev region. In the south, uh, Odessa, Mykolaiv, uh, it seems like a number of, uh, of drones have been intercepted there too. At least one got through to the central city of Vinitsia, though, uh, and hit a power plant there. And as you were just saying, Zaporizhia continuing to bear the brunt uh, of night after night of strikes from S-300 missiles. Now, these are older and cruder uh, than the cruise missiles that have been launched at other parts uh, of Ukraine. They're essentially an air defence system which has been adapted to hit ground targets. Not very accurate, but still damaging enough, as we've seen in the pictures there, hitting a car dealership, a school, uh, killing one person. It's why uh, President Zelensky is stepping up his calls for sophisticated air defence systems for Ukraine. He says this is an absolute priority. And meanwhile, Rory, Ukraine is still taking stock of all the attacks that took place yesterday. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that yesterday was a step change, really, for, for the country. Not since the beginning of the war has there been such an onslaught. Uh, so many cruise missiles uh, and drones launched at targets across the whole country. So we know now that 19 people died, another 105 uh, were injured. Critical and civil infrastructure targets were, you know, the main objects hit. Uh, we know that there were targets in 12 regions uh, and the city of Kiev. 30, fi 30 fires began. All of those are out now. 300 settlements uh, around the country, towns and villages, are still uh, without power. In Kiev itself, uh, they are planning rolling power cuts around the city, different times, scheduled at different times, uh, to try and balance uh, the power supply for the city because uh, there were uh, at least three power infrastructure targets hit in those attacks yesterday. You know, the, the, the intent is clear, isn't it, from Russia. Uh, with all of these strikes, the, what they are trying to do is to degrade the civilian critical infrastructure of the country and with hits on town centres, city centres, to instill as much fear into the population as possible. Rory Challenge reporting live from Kyiv. Thank you very much. Ukraine's ambassador to the United Nations has condemned Moscow for targeting civilian sites. He was speaking during a session of the UN General Assembly. Today, terrorist Russia shelled the capital city of Kyiv and many other Ukrainian cities throughout the country with at least 84 missiles and two dozen UAVs, energy facilities, residential buildings, schools and universities, museums, and crossroads in the city centers were among the targets that the Russian Defense Ministry later declared legitimate. Our diplomatic editor, James Bayes, has more from the United Nations in New York. Russia uh, was very unhappy with the way things uh, developed in the General Assembly. There were a number of procedural votes, none of which went Russia's way. Uh, and at the end of um, his time in the General Assembly, the Russian ambassador told me it was an outrage. He said in his time as ambassador, uh, he'd never seen anything like the way the General Assembly business was conducted by the president of the General Assembly. He said it was wrong and it's not the way business should be done at the United Nations. Now, what the 
the Russians had been hoping to do by procedure is get the vote that we're going to have at the end of this session uh, as a secret ballot vote. And that's not the way uh, the UN General Assembly normally votes. Normally, when you, a country votes in the General Assembly, everyone gets to see how they vote. Uh, but Russia was defeated in that, and it didn't like the way the procedure was handled by the President of the General Assembly. What will happen now is this session will continue. We think it's most likely, because there are lots of speakers, that the vote, the final vote, uh, which is on Russia's annexation of Ukrainian territory, will take place on Wednesday or perhaps even uh, Thursday. Now, the votes on procedure perhaps give us some idea of who is on Russia's side and who is not. And certainly, it's pretty clear from those votes, I think, uh, that when it comes to the vote on annexation, on the actual subject this is all about, uh, then Russia is not going to win that vote. Uh, James Bay's reporting there. Ukraine's air defense systems are set to get more advanced. In a phone call with the Ukrainian leader, U.S. President Joe Biden promised more support. Shihab Ratansi has more now from Washington, D.C. We've got the readout from the White House. Joe Biden expressing his condemnation at the attack, his condolences to the loved ones of those uh, who were killed or injured. But then the readout goes on. President Biden pledged to continue providing Ukraine with the support needed to defend itself, including advanced air defense systems. Now, we know already that the Pentagon says at least two, two rather, uh, surface-to-air missile systems will be in Ukraine by November. That's what they say. And, an, and another six have been pledged, although those may take years to arrive because these aren't just off the, off the peg, off the shelf. They aren't coming from the U.S.'s existing stockpiles. They have to be contracted and built. Uh, Western nations apparently rather unwilling to give their own service to air missile systems to Ukraine. They, they say that they need them themselves. These systems can attack drones and missiles and helicopters, we understand. So that, that's the, the air defense system part. I don't know whether this means that, you know, there's some, we'll hear more announcements about the perhaps a speeding up of the supply. Then, to go on with the, the readout, Biden also underscored his, his ongoing engagement with allies and partners to continue imposing costs on Russia. And now, this week, there'll be plenty of opportunity for that. We have the virtual G7 meeting on Tuesday with, with heads of state, uh, virtually meeting. And then later on in the week, we have in Brussels, the meetings of NATO and the Ukraine Defense Contact Group. That's um, a grouping that was set up in April of, of, of almost 50 nations. And we have the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Staff and the Defense Secretary already on their way to Brussels for that. Lebanon and Israel are close to resolving a long-running border dispute in the gas-rich Mediterranean Sea. Officials from both sides say a final draft deal satisfies all their requirements. Earlier, I spoke to our correspondents in Israel and Lebanon. Here's Bernard Smith in West Jerusalem. So this deal uh, comes just at the time when Israel is ready to start exploiting its field. Now, it hit some bumps last week when Lebanon made a couple of uh, last-minute demands. These were demands about the definition of a demarcation buoys that delineate Israeli waters from Lebanese waters and about potential revenue sharing from one of the fields uh, that straddles the Lebanon-Israel border. But it seems, after intense ne uh, negotiations, meetings between the US mediator, both sides have resolved these final differences and they can go ahead for a signing ceremony. Now, it is Historic. Both sides are calling this deal historic. Historic because both countries are technically at war. They have no diplomatic representation. And it's the first time any sort of agreement between these two countries has been reached. And here's Zeno Hoda reporting from Beirut. The lead negotiator, Elias Boussab, handed that draft text, that U.S. mediated draft text, uh, to the president. And he spoke to the media afterwards. And he says, Lebanon is satisfied. Our requirements have been made. This is a good deal, a deal that will bring about economic benefits. And really, this is one of the reasons why Lebanon has really been pushing for a deal along that maritime border. Intermittent negotiations have been taking place for years now, more than a decade. Decade. But Lebanon is in financial crisis. If it is able to start exploring and drilling, it could have revenues from gas production to help it with 
with the financial meltdown. But critics argue that, uh, you know, this is not a magic wand. It will take years for Lebanon to benefit uh, from those reserves, if in fact there are reserves, because the Kana field that Lebanon took in this deal, it is still not clear if it is proven gas reserves. But they're also calling it historic. These are countries in a state of war with a history of conflict. Right now, this deal will bring about economic benefits and security guarantees for both sides. Still ahead on Al Jazeera, the number of refugees worldwide is breaking records, yet the United Nations says it's short of funds. World-famous Bohemian crystal from the Czech Republic needs a constant and large supply of gas every day. I'm Scott Fassen, reporting from the Crystal Valley, where workers are concerned about their future amidst the energy crisis. Anticipation is rising, and so is the atmosphere. Are you ready? The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Hi there. It's looking rather wet and wintry across much of Europe at the moment, particularly across southern and northern areas. Across that central band, though, it's not as wet. We are still seeing some sunshine push through the cloud. But the worst of that wet and windy weather and wintry weather can be found across Iceland, with frontal systems pushing across Scandinavia, bringing some heavy snow to western areas of Norway, heavy rain to Finland and blustery winds to the Baltic states and coastal areas of Poland. For Britain and Ireland, it's a mixed bag. We've got some spells of sunshine, particularly in the south of England, but the rain is pulling in some blustery showers affecting northern areas of Scotland. But there's still some fine weather to be found across the low countries, northern areas of France. Further down south, however, it's a very wet picture across eastern areas of Spain, the Balearic Islands, and it is going to get rather wet for Sardinia. Look at that, some nasty wet weather sweeping in by the time we get to Wednesday. It'll get wetter as well for some of the Balkan countries, some thunderstorms popping off in Greece. But as we head to the southwest for Spain and Portugal, it is an improving picture with a lot of warmth coming back in in the south. Sunshine in Cordoba at 30 degrees Celsius. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Jump into the stream, where no topic is off the table. I don't think that anybody should be born into privilege to rule over us. At the end of the day, we are the subjects of the royal family. So that's one person's opinion, but what's yours? Amplify your voice. The judicial system in Mexico is incredibly weak, and it is not just corruption. Where a global audience becomes a global community. The scariest part of this moment in my country is this push for more weapons. The Stream on Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera, a reminder of our headlines this hour. Another round of Russian missile strikes has hit the Ukrainian city of Zaporizhia. The region's governor says a school was among the buildings targeted on Tuesday morning. Two rockets hit a car dealership, killing one person. Ukraine says it won't be intimidated by the wave of Russian attacks. On Monday, they killed at least 19 people and injured around 100 in several cities. The UN has joined the US and the European Union in condemning the attacks. Lebanon and Israel are close to resolving a long-running border dispute in the Mediterranean. Both sides say the final draft of the U.S.-mediated deal satisfies all their requirements. A top U.S. senator wants Washington to suspend its cooperation with Saudi Arabia. That would include a freeze on most arms sales. Senator Robert Menendez has accused the kingdom of helping fund Russia's war in Ukraine. Patty Culhane explains. For the past few days, we've been hearing from Democratic politicians in the United States upset with Saudi Arabia over OPEC's decision to cut up to 2 million barrels of oil production a day starting next month. 
They're angry for a couple of reasons. One, this is just a few weeks before the next midterm elections. Poll after poll shows the economy, inflation, some of the biggest concerns for voters, and they tend to favor Republicans to fix it. The other reason is Ukraine, and that's what we're hearing from a very powerful pol politician, Senator Bob Menendez. He's the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. He is just the latest to weigh in. In a statement writing, the United States must immediately freeze all aspects of our cooperation with Saudi Arabia, including any arms sales and security cooperation beyond what is necessary to defend U.S. personnel and interests. That he, adding that he will not greenlight any cooperation until it, meaning Saudi Arabia, reassesses their position in, with respect to Ukraine. So what they're saying is by raising gas prices, it not only hurts Americans, but it helps fund Russia's war in Ukraine. Now, the fact that he is the one saying that brings it up to a whole new level of significance because of his powerful position. We have seen uh, several members of Congress start to introduce bills, uh, ranging from cutting off Saudi Arabia from all military sales to others saying it's time to withdraw U.S. troops and defensive we weapon systems from not only Saudi Arabia, but the United Arab Emirates. And that legislation is moving its way through the U.S. Congress. A third of France's fuel stations are running short because of trade union strikes at oil refineries and storage sites. Drivers are facing long queues and closures. They're struggling to fill their tanks. The trade union accused Total Energy of blackmail for offering to bring forward pay talks if the two-week strike ends. More than 60 percent of France's refining capacity has been taken offline. Families are holding their final prayers for those killed in a nursery in Thailand last week. It brings to an end three days of mourning for the victims, 19 of whom will be cremated in a Buddhist ceremony later on Tuesday. The northeastern community of Uthai Sawan is trying to recover after a former police officer shot and stabbed 36 people, including 24 children and their carers. Japan has reopened its borders to tourists after two and a half years of COVID-19 restrictions. Travelers from 68 countries and territories can again visit visa-free, but they are still required to show proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test. The government has been under pressure from businesses to allow tourism. Fadi Salome has reaction from Tokyo. Lots of uh, people in Japan, not only the uh, eateries, not only the tourism industries, but also local governments, they have been very... Uh, very eager to see the government lifting this border control, maybe one of the strictest uh, among the, G the G7 countries and also in the world. Uh, still, uh, many people now are afraid that with all this uh, inbound numbers of tourism, maybe uh, COVID uh, cases will uh, rise again. This is why the government and also other uh, uh, agencies and institutions are going to keep very close eye to the numbers of COVID infections. There is a huge now expectations for this uh, inbound uh, number of tourists. Japan has reached almost 32 million tourists uh, during the peak uh, season in uh, 2019, and that uh, virtually came to almost zero during COVID. Now uh, they have picked up to almost 120 thousand visitors, uh, foreign visit visitors a month, but uh, they are expecting now these numbers to double and triple within the coming uh, weeks, especially that uh, not many of Japan's airports are uh, still accepting international flights. At least 18 people have died in the North Indian state of Uttar Pradesh as heavy rain lashes the region. Parts of northwest India saw significantly more rainfall than normal on Sunday. Some schools have been forced to close. Environmentalists say climate change is to blame for the unusually late wet season. Heavy rain is expected in four states until Tuesday. The death toll from Storm Julia as it moves across Central America has risen to at least 25. The storm is weakening, but it continues to cause heavy rains and flooding. El Salvador has declared a national emergency and over a thousand people have been evacuated from the worst hit areas. School has been canceled in both El Salvador and Guatemala. There are warnings of more flash flooding and mudslides across Central America and Southern Mexico. At least one person has died in Haiti as protesters clashed with police in the capital Port-au-Prince on Monday. <laughs> protesters are angry over the high cost of living.